Hey everyone, this is the Coffee of the Geek program. My name is Andy. It is February of 2020. It is uh, Valentine's Day, February 14th. Uh, with me, as always, is a fantastic guest. And this is Jill Reese, Dr. Jill Reese from SUNY Fredonia. And she is the Associate Professor of Music Education. And Fredonia, if you're not familiar, is a small town here in New York that has a great teacher's college. So Jill, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so I asked um, before about your coffee drinking, and you said you were trying to use uh, decaf these days. So <laughs> tell us about yeah. your, your decaf decision these days. Well, the fact that you use the word use rather than drink <laughs> <laughs> just brings to mind that, you know, sometimes it, uh, sometimes I would use it as, you know, like a pick me up and I'm thinking if I need a pick me up I might as well do something other than like put something in my body so you know take a nap go for a walk um, just change whatever I'm doing um, so I've been trying to drink decaffeinated teas and decaffeinated coffee um, kind of avoiding coffee altogether but um, yeah the other day so I like English breakfast tea and I asked my husband, he's a wonderful person. I asked him to um, get, you know, here's the grocery list. And I wrote down like, it's in the red box and it, here's the name of it. And because he's, I like certain things. So um, he knows that, you know, just don't get it wrong. So he came back <laughs> home and I didn't say anything about it, but he had picked me up decaf um, English breakfast tea. And I thought maybe that's a sign to be uh, from the universe that, I should just go uncaffeinated. So that's what I've been trying to do since then. And are you finding it's working? I'm finding that uh, taking a nap is actually easier now. I used to just think, 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 but taking a nap is easier. <laughs> good, good advice. Yeah. And it's cheaper too to not buy coffee all the time. So that's good. Too. I bet. So uh, tell me about your, your background in education. You've got a pretty diverse background and a lot of experiences. So let's start there. Um, well, I grew up in Michigan and um, started off in performance, music performance at Michigan State University um, in percussion. So I'm, that's my main instrument. I liked playing all these different instruments and I'd played piano since I was five. So moving to percussion and like xylophone marimba, that was a pretty easy transition. So um, so I started in percussion performance and I really was depressed at the end of my first, my freshman year. I love performing, but the space in between performances was kind of a low and I developed some performance anxiety where um, I would literally lose parts of my vision um, during when I was performing. So I started thinking there's got to be something better than this or different than this and um, picked up my sister who's 10 years younger than me at um, her elementary school because at that time I was 18 years old and she was eight years old so I picked her up from school and I picked her up early so the principal said why don't you go and observe her in her music class so I said sure so I went and observed and I had never had so I went to a Catholic school in elementary school so I'd never had elementary general music you know the music class where you go in once a week and do a variety of things so when I went to pick up my sister there were all these percussion instruments, these tiny xylophones everywhere, and the children were moving so beautifully and singing so beautifully. Um, their teacher, Sue Mueller, I thought, my God, does this, is this, is this something? Um, and from that moment on, I was smitten. I thought, this is what I have to do with my life. So um, I switched from music performance to music education, and that was the beginning, the beginning of the end, the end of the beginning, the beginning of everything for me really so um and luckily at michigan state cindy taggart was one of the music education professors there and her focus was general music and she's just a gift she was wonderful and i had the chance to teach infants and toddlers and um, really get my feet wet before student teaching so i finished my student teaching and got a job up in mid michigan teaching elementary general music which is what i wanted to do and a um, couple years into that, so teachers have to get their master's degree to sustain their certification or to get a professional level certification. And so I went to University of Michigan and realized that I kind of enjoyed doing research as well. So 
I finished up my degree as I was teaching and um, around 2006 or so I thought I think maybe I want to get my PhD where I can teach teachers. I'd had some experience um, teaching teachers during summer courses and I thought I really like teaching teachers and then I can make an impact on not just the 600 students in my school but 600 times how many pre-service teachers do I get to work with, right? So it's kind of exponential at that point. So I went to Temple University to get my, I finished my um, master's in music education at University of Michigan and got my PhD at Temple University. And again, did some more research on um, music acquisition and language acquisition and sort of parallels between those. And um, then I was offered the job at, Tem or at um, Fredonia. And that's where I've been ever since. It's an amazing place to work. The people I work with are fantastic. The students are just so hardworking and um, they uh, and very musical. So I enjoy working there. I get the chance to teach um, early childhood music. So music for children birth to about five years old within the community as part of um, the university school partnerships that we do. Um, it's just everything that I could ever want and more is what I've kind of found and created here. So I'm lucky. Um, I also have music learning theory training. Do you know what Suzuki training is, Andrew? Um, vaguely, but so maybe give okay. me a little more detail. So Suzuki is just like an approach to teaching, say, violin or other instruments that um, Shinsei Suzuki developed. It's like a pe pedagogical approach. And so there's like the Suzuki approach, there's the Orff approach, Carl Orff um, and the people that he worked with created this pedagogy for teaching young children. And there's the Kodai approach. And there's another approach called music learning theory that was created by Edwin Gordon. And his, uh, the theory of this is that music is learned in a similar pathway and a similar approach to how we learn language where we develop a large listening vocabulary before we develop a speaking kind of imitative vocabulary. And then we start creating our own combinations of that vocabulary to um, communicate with others, our own original ideas, and then and we read and write. And so it's, um, it's an approach to teaching music that is um, loosely structured around how we learn language. So I have training in that. And um, so that's part of what kind of informs my background. So let me maybe bring in one of the questions I was planned on asking later, but I think now is a really good time to maybe dig into it, is how does technology um, come into play with music? I, I think, you know, you can, you can play all kinds of instruments now just using an iPhone and then send them to GarageBand or iMovie and um, how, maybe talk about how ed tech blends into music education or, or does it just from your, I guess your perspective? Um, I would say that technology, the, all of the different ways of consuming and creating and producing and sharing music um, creates a really diplomatic, a more diplomatic um, context for music learning and music teaching and, um, and being musical. So I think the technology really has helped to open doors for people um, where you're not, I, you know, we used to, um, so there's like a funnel approach when it comes to music education. It's like everybody has music education when they're little. It's compulsory, right? So children K through fifth grade or depends on each district, they have to go to music once a week and you kind of get this, um, we call it general music because you get a singing, instruments, reading, creating, you get all of that. And then as the years go through, fewer and fewer students choose to participate in music traditionally because we've got this sort of band, orchestra, choir, three ensemble choice that a lot of students have to make. But nowadays, there are so many other doorways in. Um, usually what happened is it, in elementary school, you choose what instrument you want to play, and then there's no other beginning point after that to enter into music education. If you miss the doorway 
when you're in elementary school and you want to start playing in band in high school, well, I'm sorry, we don't have a beginning, beginning band in high school. These other students have played for so many years, right? So the opportunity is sort of lost. The window is closed for people. But with technology, you're right. There's a lot of other ways that you can create and perform music without having experience on traditional instruments. So it not only opens up doorways for creating, it opens up doorways for genres too. A lot of the reasons that the students don't participate in band orchestra choir in middle school and high school is because that music doesn't necessarily speak to them. But when you bring in technology like GarageBand and all, they can create in whatever genre they like, hip hop, whatever it is, they can create in a genre that speaks to them. So the great music teachers, um, especially the ones in middle school and high school, create opportunities to, for students to explore and create music that is culturally relevant for them, whether it's their own culture or it's teen culture or pop culture or whatever it is. Um, it's so much more relevant when it comes to um, when teachers are using technology in their classrooms. Now, I also like, like I say, I also work with children birth through five years old and five through six years old. And I think we have to be careful how much technology we are including with very young children. Um, I include so much more acoustic music making um, with the very young children, but for the older students, you know, middle schoolers, I don't know if you've ever tried to get a middle school boy who hasn't been in choir to sing before, but I'm, it's rarely going to happen and uh, not without a lot of discomfort on your part and the student's part, right? So they need a way to express themselves which is, that is comfortable and um, that speaks to them. And so I think a lot of this technology really does help them be expressive musically where they might not have had that opportunity in traditional contexts. I also think that teachers are using technology more to support their learners. Like the videos that I make for ukulele, um, it is more of a learning support. So the teacher can do what they need to do and the students can do what they need to do to become musically independent. Um, and then these learning supports, teachers can use them in their classroom, but they're on YouTube. And so students can then continue learning beyond that time that they're in the classroom and they can share it with their family members or share it with other friends. So I, technology is just, like I said, opening doors, making things so much more democratic and accessible to a variety of people who have a variety of previous experiences and interests. So tell me just quickly from your research perspective, what, um, how does music benefit young children in their development? Is that something you've explored? Yeah, I mean, how long do we have? <laughs> um, I know it's know, a big question, isn't it? It but. is, it is, but it, it's in some ways it's a simple question. So um, researchers have found that everybody is born with music aptitude. And it doesn't matter who you are, what kind of a family you come from, where you're born in the world, just like language aptitude, everybody is born with music aptitude. So, and some of us are gonna, like you think of a Barack Obama, pretty great orator, right? Um, uh, an Abraham Lincoln, great orators. And then you've got other politicians who are less, uh, uh, even a current president. His, his, not to get political, but his vocabulary is smaller, right? So we've got, everybody can talk. Some of us have a bigger vocabulary and have more developed skills because we've had more experience or different experience. Same thing with music. Everybody is born with music aptitude. Um, and depending on the richness of your environment, um, as you're growing up, your music aptitude can, um, go kind of up and down depending on the richness of the environment and the interactions that you have. If you've got parents who sing with you, if you have parents who put on recordings, if you have parents who dance and move, if they bring you to concerts, if they have um, sound making anything around and they encourage you to interact, you will remain musical. But if you have few experiences, then your music aptitude, researchers suggest, um, diminishes because of the reduced um, music interactions. Like the synapses in your brain, if you don't use them for certain purposes, they go elsewhere or your brain prunes them, right? 
So if your environment is rich, you can maintain the music aptitude that you're born with and everybody is born with music aptitude. So um, a lot of my students, I'll ask them, the pre-service teachers I work with, I'll say, um, how many of you were born to parents who say, I don't know where they got their music ability because they certainly didn't get it from me or it must have skipped a generation or something like that, right? We hear that yeah. all the time, but that may not be the case. It may be that your parents, or parents of a very musical person, maybe were born with high music aptitude, but it's possible their environment was not rich enough to help them sustain that. And so um, Edwin Gordon suggests that your music aptitude is developmental, meaning that it um, is impacted by your environment up until about nine years old or so when it stabilizes. Now that doesn't mean you can't learn beyond nine years old. It just means that your, um, your aptitude, your potential um, stabilizes. So I, I look at it, I kind of um, draw an analogy to a vehicle that you might drive. So your music aptitude is your vehicle. Um, some of us have a Maserati and we go from here to Tops in 60 seconds, right? Tops is a grocery store for those of you who aren't from the Western New York area. So all of us can go from here to Tops if we're in a Maserati, no problem. It takes us very little effort, very little time, right? Some of us are born with a Maserati music aptitude. It takes us very little effort, very little time to accomplish a lot. Um, others are born with a skateboard of music aptitude. And so we can still get to tops with a skateboard, but we're gonna be sweating. We're gonna, it's gonna take us a little bit longer and it takes a little bit more work to get there, but we can still get to tops. So your music aptitude, it doesn't mean you can't learn. It just means for some of us who have, you know, not the highest aptitude, it's just gonna take a little bit more work than other people. And I say this to the music majors I work, I work with. I say like, how many of you know somebody in this building where they can accomplish amazing things and they don't practice a lick. And they'll all raise their hand. I'm like, don't tell me if it's you. I don't want to know if it's you because we all don't like you. Um, but then uh, we all, we're all jealous of you. But, and then how many of you know someone who works their tail off to accomplish the same thing? It doesn't mean you can't accomplish great things. It just means that some of us are going to work harder than others. So everybody has music aptitude and it's up to the adults in the environment to make sure we've got rich interactions and rich interactions means face-to-face -face music making you can't just put on a recording in the same way that you can't put on a book on tape right and expect your child to learn language in the same way as if you had face-to-face -face linguistic interactions it's just not the same kind of richness so same thing for music you need to interact with your child musically doesn't matter if you have the greatest voice or not sing to them it doesn't matter if you're the best mover and shaker, move with them. You know, they, they need to see that everybody makes music and they need to be um, experiencing that in a way that's free and without embarrassment. So, so it's kind of up to the grown ups to sustain that. So a great music or rich music program in the elementary school is so important. It's the roots of the tree. Right, so the band and orchestra and all that stuff, those are the beautiful branches that have all the leaves and are very showy. But the elementary general music program and even preschool music program, parent-child music programs from you know birth through five years old, this critical period, um, that's the roots. That's where the roots are formed. And without a strong root system, that tree is just not gonna grow as beautifully and not gonna grow as strongly and it's gonna not be as stable right so it's so important birth through five years old and you know and beyond that it is super so grown-ups can learn it doesn't matter about how you grew up you can still learn you can still grow it just might take you a little longer you know you mentioned the funnel uh that happens and certainly that funnel is also part of uh other art forms mm -hmm. Would you like to get rid of the funnel in schools or is it as it should be? Um, I think, so you had one question in, in your group of questions, like <laughs> yes. what is the state Sorry. of music education? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and this is, I think where we're getting to it. I think we should not get rid of band, orchestra, and choir because those traditional performing opportunities work and are so valuable for so many people. 
Um, I say so many, but statistically, it's like 20% of the high school participates in band orchestra and choir. And so music teachers need to figure out a way to get the other 80% involved as well. And technology is such an important part of that, I think, right now. Um, again, just because it makes it accessible for people to begin to enter, it's a doorway in later. Um, and I think what we need to do at the college level is make sure that pre-service teachers are ready for that change and, um, and are considering themselves an agent of transformation. You know, it, the challenge is they are part of that 20% who really benefited from band orchestra and choir. So we need to open their eyes at the, when people are teacher, music teacher, educators need to open their eyes to these other people who um, deserve, I mean, it's a human right to be able to express yourself through music. They deserve this opportunity. It is the music educator's job to um, problem solve and to figure out how can I help these people express themselves musically, not just consume music. It's important to listen to music, but I don't think it's enough. I think they're the other 80% of people who are in band or string choir, they deserve the chance to be music makers too. Um, so I don't think that, I think we are widening that, I guess it's, I guess the funnel's this way. And that's not really a funnel, is it? It's a, a reverse no. funnel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we're, I think we're starting to broaden a little bit because we're, I, there are a lot of, teachers now who are offering more than just band orchestra choir. They're offering ukulele. They're offering guitar. Guitar has been offered for a while. Um, they're offering technology, music tech courses, music um, production courses, music industry courses where they, where students get to create their own music, produce, I was going to say record, but hopefully people understand what I mean by a record, like produce MP3s, you know, like a, and then put them on Spotify and like, they, they do all those things that a producer would do. Um, so there are programs that, that do that. And not enough, I don't think, but we're working on it. Change in education is so slow. It really is very slow. Um, it is. Yeah, so uh, that's hopefully where we're going is broadening. Well, so tell me about your YouTube channel. Um, what was its genesis? Um, and what is your, I guess, feedback from it? And where are you taking it? Mm, great questions. Um, so I started a ukulele, community ukulele group in 2015 because uh, I started enjoying playing ukulele by myself, but I also really enjoy playing with other people. It feels fun to make music with other people. So um, I found though that I didn't have any friends who wanted to play ukulele with me. Can you imagine that? Like a, <laughs> tons of music professors don't want to play ukulele. <laughs> and um, so what I did is I put an ad in the paper. So it, if you don't have, if you can't find friends who like doing what you do, just put an ad in the paper. So I put an ad in the paper and I said, for Donia ukulele community group. I just thought, okay, I'm just going to create a group. For Donia Ukulele Community Group meeting the last Friday in the month at this cafe. If you don't have a ukulele, we'll have some for you. And I thought, I wonder what's going to happen. <laughs> I wonder who's <laughs> going to show up. I wonder if anybody's going to show up. It might just be me. So at that first meeting, there, I would say there was like five, five, seven people that showed up. Um, I think two of them were people that I knew and the rest I didn't know. And so I'd never seen a ukulele jam in the community before. So I didn't really know what to do. So I thought, well, maybe I'll do this. So I put up PowerPoint slides that had like the lyrics and the name of the chord, the letter name of the chord. And also had like a picture of the chord on the side. Well, what I learned from that is the people in the group weren't confident enough in their own abilities, and weren't strong enough in their own ukulele abilities where they could play and sing at the same time. They couldn't hear when the chords changed because that wasn't part of, 
their experience just yet. So I was literally like, I had a laser pointer and I was pointing along to all of the chords as I went through. But Andrew, if you're pointing to the chords, so I created this group so I could play with other people and I'm using a laser pointer for two hours and I'm not playing with the group, right? So I was like, geez, how do I do this where, and, and my voice was just hoarse by the end of the night because it was me trying to like play and point and doing bazillion things, right? And nobody else was singing. So I was like belting it out. And um, again, I'm a percussionist, so I am not a singer. I want to emphasize that. Um, but I thought, how can I do this? How can I create the sound so that I don't have to be the only sound? And how can I have a pointer so I can still play? Like, how can I do the pointer without doing the pointer? So I went into iMovie and I created um, one of my first play along videos, which I think was maybe, yeah, it was uh, uh, um, Taylor Swift's Still, <laughs> Shake It Up. Shake All It right. Up? Yeah, Shake It Up. And um, so I created that video and that it was, it did something, like it served a purpose, but people were still angry. And here's why they were angry because like a chord would flash up and then it would disappear and then the chord would flash up the next chord and then the next chord would flash up so i learned like they gave me feedback and said jill we can't predict what's coming next so um so i thought okay so the next version i did like a series of chords and then the arrow pointed along and they were like okay that works a little bit better so i was like good and then after a couple of those sorts of videos i added like the next chord um Kevin Way at Fredonia Middle School. Yeah. Um, he had seen some of the ukulele videos that I did previously and he started making his own and he started doing next chord in the, um, in the side. And I was like, oh, that's a great idea. And so, um, so I, I got the next chord and that really helped too. So the videos have evolved throughout um, from feedback from people in my group. Um, so they originally were made just for the people in my group so I could run my jam sessions. But I thought after making the first couple of them, I thought I'll put them on YouTube and maybe somebody else will be able to use them for their group. And so now there's a whole bunch of channels like this mm -hmm. and um, over a thousand videos. I can send you that. I don't think I sent you that link, but I'll send you that link to a spreadsheet of over a thousand ukulele play along videos that various people have made, um, not mine. Uh, I've only made, I don't know, over a hundred of them, but um, yeah, it's really fascinating and all different sorts of genres now. And, um, and my channel has like over 49,000 subscribers and 14 million views, which is kind of crazy. It's incredible. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. I went to a conference <laughs> just the other day um, in Georgia and I was passing out recorders for this other session that um, someone I know was doing. And someone looked at my name tag and she was like, oh, you're Jill Reese. You're famous. <laughs> She's like, you're famous. And I thought, that feels very weird right now. Oh, that's but awesome. Also, like the videos don't, no one would know me if they saw me on the street because the videos don't have my image and the site doesn't have my image anywhere. So, um, so it, it's, it's weird for people to know my name like um, People on Facebook will message me and say, oh my gosh, my students always keep asking, where's Dr. Jill Reese? Can we play some of Dr. Jill Reese's videos? And um, so it's kind of funny. And um, students will post messages. I typically don't respond to people's um, messages on my videos because there's just so many of them. Um, especially, so I, I definitely don't respond to the ones that say like strum pattern because I'm like, oh my gosh, I give you all <laughs> of the chords I give you the music for it and you want the strum pattern too? Geez. Um, like inhale, exhale. Do you need me to write that <laughs> on the video too? So, so usually I just don't respond to those. A lot of times the users, other users will suggest strum patterns. And so I think that's kind of a great way for like the video creates this platform and then the users will interface with each other. But if it's somebody who says, we're learning this song in school, or this, this song helped me prepare for my talent show at school, if it sounds like it's a student, I will typically always respond to those to say like, oh, great, I'm so glad your teacher's using ukulele. I'm glad you enjoy it. Keep practicing or whatever. 
um, because I feel like they would get a kick out of that. So, do you think your do you show your education majors how to do your videos? Um, I did when I taught the. Uh, there's an elementary general music methods course and a secondary general music methods course. I did teach when I taught the secondary general music methods course, I did teach them how to do it. And I had them create their own videos, mostly because um, I thought they need to understand how time consuming this is. Um, so when they see other people's videos online, rather than criticizing them for saying like, I don't have this or that, or I can't believe that little mistake there, um, that they'll appreciate exactly how difficult it is to make that. So I did, when I taught the secondary general music methods course, I did. I do include them in my elementary general music methods course as a, um, as a way to support learners in the classroom, but I don't have them make a video. But online, on my YouTube channel, I have a video of how to make videos. Does that make sense? <laughs> it does. And then Perfect. on my, yeah, on my, um, I have a, website that I sent you a link to um, that's ukulele, I think in the general music classroom or in the music classroom. And there I have an entire page that includes various ways to make the videos. Um, other folks have made them, I make them with iMovie. Um, other people have made them with um, PowerPoint and things like that, various, oh, my dog, various combinations of technology. And so what I do on that, page of the website, how to make videos is just include different strategies because people have different technology, Mac based and Windows based and all that. All right. Well, believe it or not, our time has is, is come to a close. I do want to oh, so keep track of that, but you ca I can't leave you without doing the speed geek question. So hold on one second. I'm going to try and share my screen with you. Okay. I hope I get number four, <laughs> number four, number four. Um, there's a couple that I'm thinking, oh my gosh, people are gonna think I'm a fraud. <laughs> some of the answers, but. All right, can you, oh, we'll just, we'll just spin the dial anyways. It looks like I'll it's not you. letting me um, share my screen here. So <laughs> let me, uh, for some reason. All right, so we're just gonna go and I'll ask you the questions. Here we go. Okay. So you get three of them and they can All be right. quick. So uh, what tech trend do you think we should look, be looking out for? What's a tech trend to watch out for? That's that a great from... question. And this is not gonna be a great answer, but um, speaking from an educational viewpoint, I think teachers need to know that technology is always gonna be changing. So just to be open. So I, I, I think we're gonna be coming more and more and more tech um, influenced in education. So teachers just need to be open to learning from their students. I think that, which is not maybe what you're expecting from this answer, but in <laughs> education, good. it's always going to be changing. So just be open to learning from them. Great. Okay. Well, next one. Teachers don't need to be the expert. Students okay. can be the expert too. What is your favorite social network? Well, I have to say that the only social network I'm on is Facebook. So um, I guess that's my favorite by default. <laughs> um, my mom will tweet about things that I do, but I never see it because I'm not on Twitter and I have not figured out anything else yet. So like I said, <laughs> I'm a total fraud. Yes, I was trying to uh, tag you and found you, you weren't on Twitter. So I'm not. That's, that's your, maybe that's your New Year's goal. resolution. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll go one more here. Okay. And, okay, besides your students, because I think as teachers, we're always inspired by our students, but who or what inspires you? Um, Technology-wise? It can be anything. Okay, good. Um, I just love people. I love interacting with people, and I guess what I, I'm constantly trying to um, just make eye contact with people and smile at them. I know that probably sounds very weird, but um, I find that doing that creates a connection and people are always sharing things with me. So, um, so that's always good. Um, yeah. And, and I, I'm inspired by things that I read too. I don't know. 
and people are always, like I said, people are always sharing books with me and quotes with me and it's eye contact. I think it's eye contact. So I'm inspired yeah. by human connection. Great. And human to human connection. Technology is great, but human to human, there's no replacement for. Agree. All right. Well, Jill, thank you so much for Thanks taking for your time and uh, we'll see you around town. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs>